I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Hi, folks, and welcome to my newest episode. Before I dive right into this episode, I wanted to thank everyone for listening to Hellbent for Horror. For most of us on the planet, we are finishing up our first month of quarantine, and I am hoping that I've helped you pass some of that time. I am grateful for all the kind words and emails that I've gotten. I want to say that they truly do make a difference. This show is powered by those of you who listen. Hellbent for Horror is a completely independent podcast, free of sponsors and beholden only to our listeners. I don't sell advertising, and I don't waste your listening time with ads from some third party. It's your passion, which you write about so eloquently in emails, that helps keep me going. Now, with that said, independence comes with a few challenges, one of which is that independents live and die on word of mouth. If you like the show and you feel that it's given you a chance to irritate that know-it-all friend of yours, hey, spread the sickness to others. Honestly, your kind words and your reviews on iTunes have taken this show to more places than any ad guy could deliver. And I'm sure everyone out there is dealing with changes in their schedules due to the COVID-19 outbreak. It's probably not a surprise to anyone, except for me that is, that this has also delayed some of the plans we've had here at Hellbent for Har. Last episode, I mentioned that we were doing a total revamping and overhaul of hellbentforhar.com, the website. And surprise, surprise, there have been some delays. We are still working on revamping and modernizing the Hellbent for Horror website, and we are shooting for an end of April release. I bring this up because the total revamp means new website page addresses. And that means eh, we're starting all over again in the basement with Google Analytics. Once I announce that the new website is launched, I'd really appreciate it if you would visit the site to help us out of that analytics basement. Hey, when you're an independent, everything that the big boys do automatically requires a grassroots effort. I thank you for the kindness in advance. We are 100% listener funded, and if you'd like to support the show in that fashion, there are several different ways you can do it. If you want to use a debit card or credit card, you can contribute an amount per episode on Patreon. You can also use PayPal. And I know that not everyone wishes to use Patreon or PayPal. So H4H is also listed on Zelle, which is a digital transfer service that works with most U.S. banks. You can find me on Zelle through my email address, scott at hellbentforhar.com. Also, with our new website that I'm speaking of, we are rolling out the ability to pay directly on site through Squarespace. I'm also painfully aware that there aren't any great and simple options for my fans overseas, so we also have a P.O. box. If you're inclined to do so, you can send checks and money orders and even voodoo dolls in my P.O. box. The address is listed at hellbenforhar.com, as well as all the other options available to my listeners. And my international friends, especially in Europe, if there is a payment option that is friendly for you to use, please let me know. I thank you all for listening. I thank all of you who continue to help us through your kind support. And now, on with the show. You know, when I fall off the wagon, I really fall off the wagon. For those who have been longtime listeners, you know about how much I hate to do best of or top 10 lists. Whenever I'm a guest on podcasts, I'm almost always caught flat-footed when they ask me for that kind of list. The main reason is that I love so many different types of films, and I see so many movies that I fear I will forget some of them in the list. Top 10 lists and best of lists are like written and notarized confessions of your lack of worldliness. So of course, when I finally do decide to change my ways and attempt a best of list, I don't stop at doing one year. I decide to take on an entire fucking decade. And... As one would expect, I left out quite a few movies. And as one would expect, some of them were glaring omissions. Also, as one would expect, I heard about it. One of the most glaring omissions was director Jen Wexler's The Ranger. Not only did I praise that film in the past, but I had Jen Wexler on the show as a guest to discuss the making of The Ranger. So yeah, that was embarrassing, and I heard about it, and rightfully so. And... 
if there are any other movies, which I devoted an entire episode to, and I forgot to put them on the list, assume they should have been there. However, some listeners noticed the conspicuous omission of a few high-profile horror films, and they wrote me to inquire why. A few listeners believe that I snubbed one high-profile film in particular. I caught some flack because this forgotten film was the kind that I champion as a horror movie in disguise. In other words, it's a movie that isn't being marketed as a horror film, but it is a horror film at heart. Not only was this movie a horror movie in disguise, it was one that was up for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, which is another of my favorite windmills to tilt at. I've spent more than one episode talking about how horror films get a genre makeover when they get too close to those little gold statues, so it's no surprise that it stood out when I did not bring this film up in the episode. So listeners assumed my exclusion of it meant that I hated the movie. This is also understandable, as I normally don't make a habit of openly trashing a movie I didn't like, unless it really deserved trashing. Full disclosure, I did not forget about this high-profile film, and I didn't omit it because I hated it. It was initially included in my two-part episode about the last decade. However, it became apparent very quickly that this movie demanded a longer conversation that would organically fit those episodes. One of the reasons for that is because, upon further review, I realized it wasn't the only hidden horror film up for Best Picture Oscar. 2020 is the 100th year anniversary of the great German expressionist horror film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. That silent film created the visual template for the modern horror film. So I think it is wonderfully appropriate that there were three, count them, three horror films up for Best Picture this year. And each of these films carries some of that Caligari DNA that makes them true horror movies at heart. So let's just dive right in, shall we? Now, towards the end of the decade, horror started to get some mainstream acceptance as an art form. In 2018, two horror films are up for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. They were Jordan Peele's Get Out and Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. Prior to 2018, there had never been a year when two horror films were up for the big prize. Begrudgingly or not, the Academy was acknowledging a level of quality and art to the horror genre that couldn't be dismissed as placating. Just the idea that two horror films were up for Best Picture should have had horror fans doing a victory dance. Even more so when The Shape of Water did the impossible and beat out all those high-profile dramas to win Best Picture. Instead, the response was not at all what I expected. The Best Picture win was met with silence. The horror fans went quiet. Guillermo del Toro is almost always a source of conversation at horror conventions, even if the conversation is about how he's lost his touch and his movies used to be so much better. Instead, he was strangely missing from any discussions after the Oscars. I mean, history was made on that Oscar night. Even if you didn't like the history that was made, you would assume horror fans would be vocal about that. Fate was no kinder to Jordan Peele's Get Out. Now, thanks to Peele's follow-up movie, Us, and his attempt at reviving The Twilight Zone, he was the topic of conversation. He may not have liked the conversation he was part of, because that conversation was mixed, but hey, at least he was discussed. However, what really shocked me was when I brought up Get Out, and I found out that many hardcore horror fans had not yet watched it. Several of these were people whose opinions I respect. These are not your casual fans. Now I'll explain why this was such a shock, and how this is a typical behavior for longtime veterans of the horror genre. All right. We hardcore horror fans are notorious completists when it comes to our beloved genre. We watch The Lost Causes, the crappy movies that get 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, just to see if there's one good scene to talk about. Hardcore horror fans will go out of their way to watch every Jess Franco film ever made, and we will sit through an Andy Milligan movie marathon. 
We horror fans are traditionally unafraid to be made uncomfortable or be offended by a movie. I know a lot of people who watched blood-sucking freaks and hated it, but they still give the movie credit for getting under their skin. And by the way, rest in peace, Joel M. Reed, the director of Blood-Sucking Freaks, who passed away on April 12th. In fact, we hardcore horror fans go out of our way to champion the movies that are considered divisive and controversial. We will watch Snuff and Sallow, 28 Days of Sodom and Cannibal Holocaust and a Serbian film because they are notorious and they are challenging. We are like courtroom stenographers who need to record our dubious history and report back that watching that movie did not kill us. We hardcore horror fans will even watch remakes that we know we are going to hate. We will watch studio blockbusters we know will disappoint us just so we can bitch about them with the other fans at conventions. We are highly opinionated and we are relentlessly curious about our genre. We are in an endless search for the horror movie that can still surprise us. We want to be shocked. We want a movie to make us nervous and we want a movie to make us uncomfortable. We want to chase that perfect high. So, it is odd when I hear that some hardcore fans weren't curious enough to see a horror film that was up for best picture. Okay, I'm being a little facetious here. This isn't unusual. This is, sadly enough, business as usual. We have a bad habit of abandoning movies once they reach a certain level of recognition and success from the mainstream. Let's move to the present. It has been a couple of months since the 92nd Annual Academy Awards Ceremony. Now, whether the awards are relevant or accurate or not, I still see the Oscars as the official closing ceremony to a year of entertainment. And with what feels like perfect synchronicity, the Academy Awards end up being relevant to a discussion of the decade in horror. Because, once again, Horror movies were nominated for Best Picture, and once again, there was debate on whether these films were really horror movies. Gatekeepers within the horror community refused to acknowledge that the films up for Best Picture were quote-unquote real horror. I had people come up to me to ask if I thought the Oscar-winning Parasite was a horror movie. Now, they would do this with a conspiratorial tone in their voice, like they were trying to bait me. Hmm, thing about bait. Bait that doesn't hook me into a trap is merely a snack. So I enjoyed the free snack before really driving them crazy with my own ideas. See, there were three legitimate horror films up for Best Picture, and they were Joker, 1917, and Parasite. And oh boy, am I going to have some fun debating this with you. As mentioned before, it is the 100-year anniversary of The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and these three Oscar-nominated films carry that genetic material of that silent film. These three films show just how flexible and diverse the horror genre is, and how deftly it mixes with other genres to create something special. Each of these films tell their horror stories through another genre, where they create horror universes that are strangely familiar to our own. The horror may hide in very familiar surroundings, or it may bear witness to extreme surroundings, or it may wrap the familiar into the extreme. All these films use dread and shock to bring our current internal emotional anxiety into the external world so we can see it just like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari did 100 years ago. These films are part of a time-honored and constant evolution that allows horror to continue to be a vital genre through the decades. However, that evolution is not always welcomed or even acknowledged. Over the last decade, there has been an increasingly long list of films that are being contested as to whether they are horror movies or not. The debate is spurred by either cinema lovers who dismiss horror but appreciate a specific film, or gatekeepers obsessed with genre purity. The more unique and the more mature and the more diverse that horror films get, the more they are being denied their pedigree. And because of that, I want to discuss what makes each of these movies such original takes on the horror story. 
because I think they are a culmination of decades of ambitious experimentation with the boundaries of horror. And this may piss some people off. Because I have seen those Twitter posts about how Parasite is not a horror film. They are wonderfully dismissive posts, barely able to deem the film worthy enough for their criticism. You can almost hear the yawn rising from the computer screen. And they love to infer that if you think this is a horror film, then you are not a quote-unquote real horror fan. Well, consider me a counterpoint to those voices. And let me give examples of how Parasite, 1917, and Joker are horror movies that speak directly to our moment in time, just like a certain horror film did back in 1920. Now, before I go into a discussion of these films, I need to give a spoiler alert. I did the best I could to not give away a lot about these films, because they're new. But in order to discuss what makes them horror movies, some details need to be given. So I strongly suggest that you watch these three films before you dive into this episode. The German expressionism of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is right at home in this recent decade of dread. German expressionism distorted reality for emotional effect. It gave expression to the internal emotions that were beyond words. It brought those inner emotions to the external world by invoking them through a series of images, and those images were mostly disturbing. German Expressionism was used as a form of protest against a failing social system and an indifferent government. After World War I, Germany dived into a massive inflation to pay off an expensive war, which made the price of food soar. 700,000 Germans starved to death after the war had ended. Movies like Caligari and The Last Laugh and Fritz Long's M were shouts of rage against a broken system that abandoned the people. So, I'm sure it's just a coincidence that an R-rated horror movie that made $1 billion was steeped in an expressionistic universe just like Caligari's for the modern day. Now, before I get rolling... May I stop first and say how happy I am that I live in a time where a movie like Todd Phillips' Joker could make a billion dollars. Whether or not I feel the movie was ultimately successful in telling its story, I am in awe that this dark, dark film was a mainstream hit. It is undeniable that Joker tapped into a cultural anxiety that needed exploring and needed release. So even though the movie made over a billion dollars, I still want to give a spoiler alert to those who may not have seen Joker yet. So, spoiler alert. Joker is an original, standalone story that gives its own take on the origin of one of the most iconic villains in DC comic book history. Maybe all of comic book history. This movie still takes place in Gotham City, but not in the Gotham City as we usually know it. Gotham is usually a place victimized by evil men, but this Gotham is the epitome of institutional evil, a cold place indifferent to human suffering, and most of its residents are just as cold and indifferent. The billionaire Thomas Wayne and his family are in this film, but not as we usually see them. In this film, Thomas Wayne is an out-of-touch magnate who blames the poor for all their own problems while at a charity event to benefit them. We hear that he is the only hope to save Gotham, yet the man we meet fiddles while Rome burns. And of course, it has the character who will become the Joker. And this Joker is, on one hand, the darkest version of the iconic character we love to hate, but on the other hand, this Joker is such a complete philosophical break from the iconic character that he is almost unrecognizable, except for the face paint. I think the most audacious thing about Joker is that it is ostensibly a film based on an iconic and long-standing DC Universe character, and it could care less about the DC Universe or the 80 years of the character's history. Todd Phillips realized that the persona of the Joker had mutated over the decades to barely resemble its DC Comics roots. The Joker, 
is a brand name that brings a large audience that gets bigger with every mutation that the character goes through. A lot of that mutation comes from Christopher Nolan's movie The Dark Knight and Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker. In that film, and with that performance in particular, the Joker became a symbol for anarchy. And anarchy, thy new brand name is the Joker. Todd Phillips ran with that idea, keeping only the brand names and the symbolism and pushing that symbol further from its traditional past. He knows that we know the traditional past, and so he uses his stark departure from it to make a point about the present. And the result is that Todd Phillips created a cautionary horror film that may be the grimmest blockbuster ever made. There is a certain brilliance in the audacity of trashing the arcana and distilling it to a visceral emotional experience. Todd Phillips' Joker creates an unrelenting horror movie universe. It is our world, distorted into an embodiment of our worst anxieties about the fear we have that society is falling apart. In Joker, our fears about dark and threatening cities all manifest and happen at the same time. No systems work. The police are never around when you need them. The subways are unsafe. Nobody will help you, and nobody will even talk to you. Caligari's 1920s Berlin has been replaced with Gotham City circa 1981. Gotham City is as dreary and run down as East Berlin. Just like in The Cabin of Dr. Caligari, we are seeing the city through the eyes of the main character, and it is painted with his anxieties. And it is important and necessary for us to see the world through his point of view. For a horror movie universe to work and to function as an allegory or as a cautionary tale, the deck needs to be essentially stacked. There needs to be no hope and no choice other than the insane choice that the character inevitably will need to choose. Because that's where the horror lives. In this film, the Joker is more of a state of mind, or a mental illness, or a demonic possession of our main character who is named Arthur Fleck. That's right, it's not Jack Napier, as some might remember from the comics, but Arthur Fleck. His name may as well be Schlubby Schlubberson. Arthur is a clown for hire who suffers from severe depression and a mental condition wherein he laughs uncontrollably when he's upset. Now, that's not only symbolic, but it's also a clever nod to the silent film The Man Who Laughs. The main character from that film is who Bob Kane based the Joker on. Now, the character of the Joker has always been characterized as being insane, or more accurately, criminally insane. He was a sociopath or a psychopath who did what he wanted on sheer impulse, and he had no remorse for anything he did. In other words, a perfect cipher for anarchy. Arthur Fleck, on the other hand, suffers from an entirely different type of mental illness. His illness stops him from doing anything or achieving anything, and it separates him from the world. Alienation and isolation are Arthur's constant companions, and the horror universe rains down its cruel indifference upon him. And the alienation and isolation withdraw Arthur from reality and into a delusional fantasy life. Little by little, the movie removes any real support Arthur has in his life until he is literally left alone with his demons in his fantasy world. As the movie goes on, and the tragedy and the violence build up around Arthur, we can no longer be sure we are watching any form of reality. Like The Cabin of Dr. Caligari, we become unsure if we can believe our protagonist or if we can even trust our own eyes. The only thing in the movie that we can be sure of is whether the world is ready for him or not. The Joker is on his way. Now, Joker owes a lot to the movies Taxi Driver, The King of Comedy, and Buddy Giovinazzo's Combat Shock. But those movies were counterculture or underground hits that became iconic after they were discovered upon re-release. That is definitely not what happened with Joker. Joker hit a nerve, and it did so in an almost impossible way. 
While Star Wars fans are writing letters of protest to expunge sequels that violate their precious canon, Todd Phillips completely rewrote the canon of the Joker and what Bruce Wayne represents and what Gotham symbolizes. In a time when superhero franchises are as precious and as guarded as the Golden Fort Knox, this act of insolence is groundbreaking. And I think this is the only character in all of comic books, both DC and Marvel, where this approach would work. And that might be the real brilliance here. Joker is brand name anarchy and lawlessness that is supported and propelled by audience franchise loyalty. Phillips brought the audience with brand recognition and then dared to transform it into something as expressionistic as Munch's The Scream. With all of that said, a movie doesn't make a billion dollars unless it speaks directly to a generation in a way they haven't been spoken to before. I think that Joker may just be the easy rider of this generation. It speaks to a philosophical difference between the generation who grew up with Travis Bickle and the generation who embraces Arthur Fleck. One generation sees the movie Joker as sour and pompous and the other sees a flawless parable of life in the 21st century. Towards the end of Joker, Arthur Fleck is being interviewed by a condescending social worker. He has a bout of uncontrollable anxiety laughter, and when she asks about it, he says, I want to tell you a joke, but I don't think you would get it. And one generation knows exactly what he means. The phenomenal success of Joker despite it being the kind of movie that normally becomes a cult classic, does make me ask the question, would the central story of Arthur Fleck have made a billion dollars if his inner demon didn't have that distinctive green hair color and makeup combo? Now, who knows? Perhaps the point of all of this is to break down the coveted brands that are so protected by the status quo. Perhaps the point is to desecrate the overly safe screenplays that protect franchise movies at the sacrifice of any real surprises. Perhaps Todd Phillips needed to kill the Joker in order to free him from an older generation that no longer understands him. Like Easy Rider before it, if you don't get why the Joker is important, then you're part of the problem. So before I dive into the next film, let me give a quick refresher on my definition of what makes a horror film a horror film. I use the dictionary definition of horror, which is an intense feeling of shock, dread, repulsion, or terror. So a horror film is a movie that gives you an intense feeling of shock, dread, repulsion, or terror. But I also look at why the filmmaker wants to give you those intense emotions to tell their story in the first place. Why? Out of all the different film styles that they could choose from, did the filmmakers choose horror elements to tell their specific story? And at the end of the film, what is the emotion that the filmmaker wants to send you home with? I think it's important to look at all those questions when I'm discussing the next film, which is Sam Mendes' 1917. Because there are war films that deal in horror, but this is a horror film that deals in war. War films and even westerns have something in common with horror. All three genres mix well with other genres to create allegories or metaphors. Most memorable westerns aren't really about the western expansion. They are quests or they are sagas that replace the Greek gods with cowboys and rustlers to tell morality plays. When it comes to war films, there are several different subcategories to pick from. There is a group that are based on real battles and incidents, and they strive for some historical accuracy. Those would be films like The Longest Day and Midway and Letters from Iwo Jima and Zulu. And then there's another group that are loosely based on actual battles and incidents as a way to explore morality and social commentary. Those would be films like Bridge on the River Kwai and From Here to Eternity and The Cain Mutiny. And then there's another group that uses the war movie as a template to tell subversive or even anti-war stories. Those would be films like Catch-22 and Kelly's Heroes and M.A.S.H. And then there is a much smaller group of films that deal exclusively in the horrors of war on a visceral level. 
A good modern day example is Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down. It is based on the true story of the Battle of Mogadishu, where U.S. Special Forces must fight an armed Somali militia after their helicopter crashes. But this film works as a horror movie because it is a visceral and dread soaked vision of anarchy once that Black Hawk goes down. Also, the movie omits the Malaysian and Pakistani forces who helped the Americans get out of there. So what we're left with is that they are alone as they fight shadowy forces in the dark. It's like a military version of the Warriors. Another horror movie about war is Come and See, a Russian film about the Nazi occupation of Belarus and their attempted genocide of it. The movie is a mixture of hyper-real violence, visual surrealism, with a bit of biblical apocalypse thrown into it. The filmmakers used real bullets on set instead of blanks, and they used real villagers as extras, and many of the Nazi uniforms were real. You can kind of feel it. However, if there is one war that inspires more horror movies than any other, I would like to say it is World War I. Most traditional war movies are either action films or human dramas. They want to excite you with tales of valor and noble human sacrifice. There is usually some kind of an objective, like the storming of Normandy or the taking of Hamburger Hill. But that is not what you get with films about World War I. That's not the key objective of what the movie is about. These films are about war at its most mad, where there are no historically famous generals and there are no fondly remembered battles. A battle in World War I would rage for months just to win 50 yards of land, which would then be lost again in a few more months. There are only miles of trenches and miles of barbed wire and bombs and mustard gas and the 9,911,000 men who died in this combat. World War I was an exercise in the madness and the pointlessness of combat, and the movies based on it are full of dread and nihilism. These movies drip with shell shock and doom. World War I can't help but inspire horror movies. You can see it in the silent film All Quiet on the Western Front, which is full of horror imagery verging on the surreal. There's a sequence where a soldier hangs onto a barbed wire fence as a bomb explodes near him. When the smoke clears, all that's left are his severed hands still dangling from the wire. And then there's Dalton Trumbo's Johnny Got His Gun, which was made infamous by Metallica's video for their song One. This is a film about a soldier who is horribly wounded when a bomb goes off right next to him. He loses his arms, and his legs, and his eyes, and his face, and his throat, and his tongue, and he is left alone on a hospital bed. And we are trapped with him inside his head. Ho, ho, ho. Intentions matter, and in those movies, the filmmaker's intentions are to immerse you in raw and primal emotion. They are highly expressionistic movies that bring you a sense of shock, dread, repulsion, and terror. And that brings me to 1917, a film set in World War I France, and it is a horror film from start to end. 1917 doesn't feel like a war film because it doesn't seem interested in giving you any factual information about World War I. In fact, unless you come into the film knowing something about World War I, you will learn very little about it from the movie 1917. You will not know why the war is happening. You won't know where it's happening unless you know the names of villages in France. 1917 is as much about World War I as Jaws is a movie about maritime fishing laws. This is not a criticism of 1917 because it is not the intention of director Sam Mendes to make a historical drama about World War I. This film is meant to be felt to be a fully immersive experience that jolts you into being totally present with the visceral emotions of war. 1917 wants to do its best to give you a brief taste of hell, and it succeeds more than once. This film is told in one continuous shot, a technical conceit that cements this as a horror film for me. From the very beginning of the film, we are off balance and trying to catch up with what is going on around us. We start out in a nice, quiet pastoral field under a tree, and then a sergeant appears and whisks off two soldiers to a new detail, and we follow along. There is no context, and we have no idea where we are, 
and there is very little exposition about the two soldiers that we follow. We don't know who they are, but we are following them, and we only find out information as the characters get it. We only see what the characters see, so there are no establishing shots or viewpoints from other characters. And we feel the dread start to build as the pastoral field gives way to rubble and debris and then trenches that lead into the ground. As we travel down the seemingly endless trenches and we sink deeper into the ground, we are disoriented and we are vulnerable. These two soldiers are sent on a suicide mission to cross into enemy lines to stop 1,600 soldiers from marching into a trap at daybreak. They are given a letter with direct orders, and they need to deliver them to the field general. They not only need to deliver these orders to the field general, but they need to convince him that they are real orders. At one point, a fellow officer tells the soldiers to make sure that there are witnesses when they speak to the general because some men can't stop the war fever once it strikes. As if that isn't enough anxiety, there's one more piece of information to add to the sense of dread. One of the soldiers is told that his brother is one of the 1,600 soldiers that he is being sent to save from the slaughter. They are pointed in the direction they need to go. And that is it. End of exposition. The rest of the film is the journey which is one continuous forward motion into the surreal horrors of war. And because this film is told in one continuous shot, we breathe every breath of these two soldiers, and we feel the clock ticking. And this also means we are trapped along with them in the immediate environment around them, only able to see what's right in front of them. We are unable to see what's in the dark, or what's around the corner in a tunnel, or what's under the water, or what's behind the closed door. Or... What lies beyond the foggy horizon within no man's land? So when a rifle gets fired, or someone screams in the darkness, we jump. There is no musical accompaniment. There is just ragged breathing, and boot heels crunching into bloated dead bodies and shattered skulls. And as the clock keeps ticking, the tension and the dread builds. How does this feel like a horror film, you may ask? Well, there are the obvious things, like the mud walls of trenches that have corpses hanging out of them. A lot of corpses. There's a great horror trope when one soldier cuts his hand on barbed wire, and then later he falls and his wounded hand plunges directly into the chest of a corpse. We can feel the disease building in his hand from that moment on, and we know he can't stop to get it properly cleaned. It's the same dread we feel if someone gets bit by a zombie. But the real reason that this is a horror film is because it uses the unknown to keep us scared of what's around the next corner. It refuses to give us any information as we blindly walk forward into the dark. There is no room for exposition, or for a moment of rest, or for those inspirational moments that normally show up in war films. There is no fucking point to any of it. Just death and doom. We go into the ground with two men, into dark tunnels, and when we come out the other side, the world is turned upside down. We are tossed without any context into a city on fire at night, and all we hear are screams and gunshots. 1917 wants us to dread every step we take, and it intends to fill us with shock and horror and revulsion. The experience of being continuously present with these two soldiers in 1917 reminded me of back when I played the first Resident Evil video game. Back when that game first premiered, that straight-ahead point-of-view shot that Resident Evil pioneered started to get to me within a few minutes. The first time a zombie jumped out and grabbed my character, I jumped. I slowly realized that I was breathing heavy and I was leaning forward playing the game. It was the first time I ever got scared at a video game, and that was incredibly powerful to me. Now, I am not denigrating or oversimplifying 1917 by comparing it to a video game. On the contrary, it was fascinating to realize how often film editing breaks the tension of a film scene, and how removing obvious edits intensifies the emotions. You have to sit right there. 
Nearly all of 1917 is told visually, and the visuals get more expressionistic and more surrealistic as the story continues. There is a bombed-out city that looks like it came straight out of the surreal Berlin of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. We are in the shadows of fires and flares and miles of bomb craters full of rotting dead bodies, and the flames make the bodies look like they are still moving. Of course, the horror and the anxiety increase when you realize that those craters are perfect camouflage for a German soldier that's lying in wait. Now, you'll have to watch 1917 to find out how all this ends. But I will say that this movie projects a cold darkness in bright morning light. There is a moment towards the end of the film that takes place at dawn. The scene was so beautiful and so peaceful, and it went on for so long that I was suddenly terrified. I was sure it was the last shot of the film, and if it were the last shot, the subsequent tragedy would be nearly too much to bear. Perhaps the nagging dread I felt was my cinematic version of shell shock. Imagine my surprise when the real end of the film was no less bleak. Earlier I mentioned that one of the things I look for when trying to decide if a film is a horror movie in disguise is the filmmaker's intention. What emotion does the filmmaker want you to go home with? If this were a standard war film, 1917 would end when the hero's quest was completed and the audience could at least rest easily. But after the quest reaches its close, 1917 spends a little extra time with a field general in the trenches. And the general gives us a monologue that reminds us of the much bigger picture of combat and makes the quest we just took suddenly meaningless. And then we linger in a vast hospital tent out in the grassy fields, grassy fields that are red. And the feeling of victory that we invest ourselves in is gone. 1917 is a horror movie disguised as a war movie. Back in 1920, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari gave us more than just the visual template for the modern horror film. It is the first horror film that introduced a thematic twist that made you question what you just saw and what you believed earlier in the film. Spoiler alert. Yes, spoiler alert on a hundred-year-old film. Here's the twist that happens in Caligari. It is revealed to us that our main character is an unreliable narrator, like Arthur Fleck was in Joker. For most of the duration of the film, we are seeing Dr. Caligari as an evil magician who forces a hypnotized soul to kill for him. But in the end, is he really just a kind but benign physician? an administrator running the insane asylum that we find out that our narrator is in? Or is he imprisoning more than one somnambulist in a much bigger cabinet? There have been many interpretations of this ending. Some think our unreliable narrator is a metaphor for the post-war German people who tried to blame everyone but themselves for their plight. Others think that Caligari is the German government, pretending to help the citizens but really doing just enough to enslave the populace. The answer probably came down to what side of the social unrest you were part of in post-war Germany. And yes, that means all the way back in 1920, horror films were full of biting social commentary. Eat it. Whatever your interpretation, the last few moments of Caligari changes the happy ending we had into one that ends in dread. Why does the filmmaker want you to feel dread? Why does the filmmaker want you to go home with the emotion dread on your mind? Those follow-up questions are the key to seeing Bong Joon-ho's Parasite as the wonderfully clandestine horror film that it is. Because Parasite is a Venus flytrap of a film. It's a camouflage trapdoor spider waiting to strike. Out of the films that I've discussed so far in this episode, Parasite is the one I really wanted to dig into. And it is also the one that I risk ruining for you most of all if I dig into it. 
Ah, yes, the bitter irony. Because Parasite is meticulously built on layers of secrets and surprises. And because of that, knowing too much going in would spoil the impact. And I don't want to be the guy that knocks down the Jenga tower. I will give the obligatory spoiler alert. And I will also say that I hope the idea that it's a foreign film or that mainstream critics loved it won't keep you from experiencing the film. It is not an esoteric, impenetrable art film. Even though there is an incredibly dark soul at the center of this film and it's a merciless cultural satire that cuts in every direction, Parasite is a wildly entertaining and compelling movie. One that is made more entertaining and compelling if you go in without knowing too much about it. I'm painfully aware that I don't want to kill the anticipation. So, what am I going to do? I'm only going to give you as much detail as you'd get watching the trailer, and then I'll sprinkle in a few observations that won't blow any big surprises. I will also reference other challenging and offbeat horror films to use as a comparison, and a way to comment without giving anything away. But it's also a fun way to disprove all the reasons people give The Parasite isn't a horror movie by comparing it positively with other horror films. First, let me give you the elevator pitch synopsis of the film. Parasite tells the story of two families, one rich and one poor, and how the poor family sneaks its way into working on the rich family's estate. They do this one family member at a time, pretending to only know each other through professional referrals. In this elite world, referrals matter more than resumes and degrees. The rich family seems blissfully clueless, and the poor family strokes the egos of their employers to stay one step ahead in their amazing con game. And what is their con game? Are they out to discover where the safe is to steal the family fortune? No. They run this con game so that they can earn a livable wage in the modern economy. Boom. It's the kind of subversive class warfare comedy that Louis Boonwell might have made. Until, that is, there is a one dark and stormy night moment when everything goes to hell. And once things start going to hell... It just keeps heading that way until the story comes to its chilling and violent conclusion. And when we reach that conclusion, all those things that used to be funny in Parasite are now horrible. Hindsight makes a second viewing of Parasite feel like you're watching an entirely different movie. And that is part of what makes Parasite so brilliant and so unsettling. Director Bong Joon-ho knows that when it comes to class and poverty and a broken system, we will come with our own preconceived notions. We will, consciously or not, take sides and affix labels to characters. And this means as Parasite transforms and squirms in surprising directions, we may find ourselves questioning those notions. Now much is made about how much comedy there is in Parasite. Even with the tonal shift of the twist, Some say there's way too much comedy for a horror film, and the first half of the movie is pure comedy. Well, I don't want to fall too deep into the rabbit hole on genre labels, mainly because I champion hybrid vigor, which is the combination of genres to create fresh storytelling that frees us from strict labels. And Bong Joon-ho has made a career of hybrid vigor, especially with a mixture of horror and comedy, like his previous film, The Host. If you were to say the first half of Parasite is a comedy, or a farce, or a satire, or slapstick, I would agree that the film has all of those elements. The first half of Parasite does feel like a Juzo Itami farce about class warfare, like his movie The Funeral. But I think that all those comedic and farcical elements are in service to the horror of the story. The first half of the story is the wind-up for the gut punch that's coming. Another great but controversial horror film that does this is Takashi Miike's Audition. Now, Miike intentionally stages the first half of the film like it's a popular style of traditional Japanese romantic comedy. The grotesque carnage of the second half comments on the twisted misogyny that's hidden in those comedies and, in turn, hidden in Japanese society. 
Another movie that uses comedy to set up the hard gut punch is the excellent Spanish film Sleep Tight. It's about the concierge in an apartment building who is also a sociopath. Since he can feel no joy, he decides to make the life of all the tenants hell by finding subtle ways to ruin their days. It's a funny, dark comedy, until a woman who is an eternal optimist moves in. And then the film's tone slowly turns from uncomfortable to horrifying. See, this tenant's unflappability drives the concierge to extremes as he tries to break her will. And the ending of Sleep Tight may just stick with you for a while. Like Audition and Sleep Tight, Parasite uses comedy to camouflage its horror movie intentions. But the darkness was always there in plain sight if you really looked. In Audition, it was there in how the older man ignores all the warning signs because he was getting his fantasy fulfilled and he got to feel a little powerful over a woman. In Sleep Tight, we see the concierge use petty authority to abuse the helpless, but he also uses the helpless to absolve himself of wrongdoing. And we see that almost from the first frame. And for Parasite, we might think that the con game the family runs is a victimless crime, that they are sticking it to the man. But all they are doing to the man is fulfilling a service and getting a paycheck which in the real world, just being honest, they weren't getting. But someone was fulfilling the service and getting the paycheck before that family appeared. Someone from their own class level. And this family doesn't even blink to get rid of them to get to that paycheck. One of the things that I think is great about Parasite is that it cleverly hides its horrors in plain sight and in broad daylight. The same locations and the same structures and the same images and even a character's actions go from banal to threatening during the film. The movie is full of horror movie tropes and symbolism, but they are disguised to blend into this world of comfort and joy. I mean, what could possibly go wrong in a place that has such well-kept lawns? There is a haunted house in this movie, but from the outside appearance, it is a beautiful estate that anyone would want to live in. Only later in the film does the house reveal any dark secrets. There are ghosts that haunt this house and haunt the inhabitants, and the ghosts are both literal and symbolic, like the sleepwalker is in Caligari. These specters are connected to the house, and once they are disturbed, they become malevolent. And then there is a cursed object that is mistaken for a gift, and that cursed object helps bring the downfall of everyone in its vicinity. I'll be coming back to this cursed object, because it's an important character in the film. Heaven and Hell, and Who Gets to Live Where, is a subject that looms large in Parasite. Paradise and the underworld are symbolized by where the two families live in the city. The rich family lives high above the rest of the city, where their huge modern home is hidden from the street by plain concrete walls. The poor family literally lives underground in the slums in a basement apartment whose only window opens out to a street gutter. The highest that they can see is gutter level. The rich family live on a property that looks like the English countryside. The poor family has a stink bug infestation and they keep their window open while the city fumigates the alley. Parasite has some thematic similarities to another horror film that discussed class, Jordan Peele's Us. In Parasite, there are four members of each family, a husband, a wife, a son, and a daughter. And the rich and poor families are warped funhouse mirror reflections of each other. And like Us, The family that is forced to live in the underworld wants to live in paradise and forcibly enters that world. Both Us and Parasite have another important thing in common that I think firmly plants them in horror territory. These films don't hate the rich as much as they hate the system and the conditions that allow such a deep division between the rich and the poor. In this way, The rich father in Parasite is more like the Dr. Caligari in the twist ending of that film than the one we first meet. The rich father is the benign administrator of an insane asylum of his own creation. 
and his very existence creates sleepwalkers that are drawn to knock on his door. He is polite, but every interaction is a test, an experiment, to see if the somnambulist is really asleep or if they are faking it. We see that Caligari is as trapped in the cabinet as the sleepwalkers are. Now, I mentioned the cursed object in the movie, and now I want to come back to that. I want to end the discussion with talking about the cursed object. So the poor family is given a very prestigious gift from an old friend who is obviously doing much better financially than they are. It is a gong shi, commonly known as a scholar's rock. It is a large polished rock that is mounted on a beautiful wooden pedestal, and the family is duly impressed. Before Parasite, I had never even heard of a scholar's rock, so I looked it up. Scholar's rocks are naturally occurring or naturally shaped rocks which are traditionally appreciated by scholars. They can weigh hundreds of pounds or less than a pound, and they can be any color. They can be found in the woods or in a stream or pretty much anywhere. So you might ask, what makes a scholar's rock a scholar's rock and not just an everyday rock with little to no value? A scholar appreciates it and calls it a scholar's rock, and suddenly it is a scholar's rock. Suddenly, the rock has value. What makes something valuable is that someone of importance says it is valuable, and if they don't see value, value doesn't exist. And that is the curse that haunts the house and possesses the families and awakens the ghosts and destroys everything around it. And that is why Parasite is a horror film. These three Oscar-nominated films, 1917 and Joker and Parasite, hit a nerve on where we as a world culture find ourselves now. Parasite may take place in Korea, but it could easily be London or Manhattan or San Francisco or Gotham. I think that dread and a sense of uneasiness about the future can't help but bubble up into our art, especially in the horror film. The expressionistic horror of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari was a scream of frustration from citizens of a country who were starving and felt forgotten. And here we are, 100 years after that film put visuals to our collective internal anxiety and our horror films are screaming for us again. It's no surprise that in times like these, our horror films would be the art form that tells the ugly but necessary truth about ourselves. I'm overjoyed that horror films like Joker, 1917, and Parasite exist to document where we are in history and remind us of our past at the same time. Because right now, we are surrounded by Caligaris, and we worry about how many sleepwalkers there are in the world. And horror movies will always remind us that we need to look in the mirror and see if we are sleepwalking too. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. Please hit that subscribe button to get H4H hot off the press. And if you can do a review on iTunes or whatever app you listen to us on, that really helps people get to find us. And now for some Hellbent for Horror news. The podcast is available on some more outlets now, so you can listen to H4H on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, as well as the regular iTunes, Android, and Amazon apps. And let there be swag. H4H t-shirts are now on sale. We have a store on tpublic.com with a bunch of Hellbent for Horror designs, and you can have your choice of t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, something horrible beautiful for you or that someone special. The link to the merchandise store is on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. And until we meet again, stay hellbent.